for sticking around. Thanks for uh, having a big red X burned in your eyeballs for the next three days. Uh, today I want to talk about the, uh, the meaning of words, um, how we define them and how they, almost as revenge, define us. Um, the English language is a magnificent sponge. Uh, I, I love the English language. I'm glad that I speak it. I think you all are, are lucky to speak it as well. Um, but for all that, it has a lot of holes. Uh, in Greek, there's a word, uh, lachesism, which is the hunger for, for disaster. You know, when you see a, a thunderstorm on the horizon and you just find yourself rooting for the storm. Uh, in Mandarin, they have a word, yu yi, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, uh, which means the longing to feel intensely again the way you did when you were a kid. In, uh, in Polish, they have a, a word, juska, uh, which is the the kind of hypothetical conversation that you compulsively play out in your head. And, uh, and finally, in German, of course in German, uh, they have a, a word called uh, Zielschmerz, which is the dread of getting what you want. <laughs> of finally fulfilling a lifelong dream. I'm German myself, so I know exactly what that feels like. Now, I, I'm not sure if I would use any of these words as I go about my day, but I'm really glad they exist. But the only reason they exist is because I made them up. Um, I am the author of The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, uh, which I've been writing for the last seven years. Yeah. Um, and it, the whole mission of the project is to sort of find holes in, in the language of emotion and try to fill them so that we have a way of talking about all those human peccadillos and quirks of the human condition that, um, that we all feel but may not think to talk about because we don't have the words to do it. Um, it started actually watching the end credits of Saturday Night Live, and I was beset by the most beautiful and haunting melancholy. Uh, if, you, if you ever get a chance to stay up that late, I would urge you to, to watch the end credits of SNL. Um, and so I, I decided to try to, to define that emotion. And about halfway through this project, um, I defined Sonder with the idea that we all think of ourselves as the main character and everyone else is just extras. But in reality, we're all the main character. And you yourself are an extra in someone else's story. Um, and so as soon as I, I published that, um, I got a lot of response from people saying thank you for giving voice to something that I had felt all my life, but I, I, there was no word for that. So it made them feel less alone. I think that's the power of words, uh, to make us feel less alone. And it was not, not long after that that I started to notice Sonder being used earnestly in conversations online. Uh, and not long after that that I actually noticed it, I, I caught it next to me in an actual conversation in person. There is no stranger feeling than making up a word and then seeing it take on a <laughs> mind of its own. I don't have a word for that yet, but I will. <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, I, I started to think about what makes words real. Because a lot of people ask me, the most common thing I got from people is, well, are, are these words made up? I don't, I don't really understand. And I didn't really know what to tell them, because once Saunders started to take off, who am I to say what words are real and what aren't? And so I sort of felt like Steve Jobs, who described his, his, his epiphany as when he realized that most of us, as we go through the day, we just try to avoid bouncing against the walls too much and just sort of get on with things. But once you realize that, that people, uh, th that this world was built by people no smarter than you, then you can reach out and touch those walls and even put your hand through them and realize that you, you have the power to change it. It's phenomenal. So I think from there, that changed how I look at words and what makes words real. And when people ask me, are these words real, I had a variety of answers that I tried out. Some of them made sense, some of them didn't, but one of them I tried out was, well, a word is real if you want it to be real. You know, it, it, the way that this path is real because people wanted it to be there. That happens on college campuses all the time. It's called a desire path. <laughs> and 
And so it's, you know, language is a reflection of desire. It's something that they want to be there. And it may be the road less traveled, but, you know, it'll, it'll get there eventually. Um, but that's not really a satisfying answer, so I gave up on that one. Um, but then I decided what people are really asking when they're asking if a word is real, they're really asking, well, well how, many, how many brains do you, will this give me access to? Because I think that's a lot of how we look at language. A, lang a word is, is essentially a key that gets us into certain people's heads. And uh, if, if it gets us into one brain, it's not really worth it. Not really worth knowing. Two brains, eh, it depends on who it is. A million brains, okay, now we're talking. And so a real word is one that gets you access to uh, as many brains as you can. That what, that's what makes it worth knowing. Uh, incidentally, the realest word of all by this measure is this. That's it. The realest word we have, that is the closest thing we have to a master key. That's the most commonly understood word in the world, no matter where you are in the world. The problem with that is no one seems to know what those two letters stand for. <laughs> Which is kind of weird, right? I mean, it could, it could be a misspelling of all correct, I guess, or old kinderhook. No one really seems to know, but the fact the fact that it doesn't matter says something about how we add meaning to words. The meaning is not in the words themselves. We're the ones that pour ourselves into it. And I think when we're all searching for meaning in our lives and searching for the meaning of life, and I think words have something to do with that. And I think if you're looking for the meaning of something, the dictionary is a decent place to start. I, I, I saw uh, an interview with the uh, religious scholar Reza Aslan. He, he was describing um, a misunderstanding that many people have about religion. He said that what a religion is, uh, is basically a set of symbols and metaphors that people pour themselves into to try to express something inexpressible. Religion is essentially just a language. That's all it is. It's a container for whatever meanings we bring to it. And that got me thinking, what if language was a kind of religion? That would mean that this is, this is basically our holy book. And if you think of a creation story, it's really more of a, a definition story. Like, in the beginning, there was chaos upon the waters of the earth, and then God separated the land from the sea, the fish from the birds, the man from woman, the eternal from the ephemeral. That's all in these pages. That's what a definition is. And so if, if we're looking for, for meaning in the world, this is our faith, this is our holy book. Because the reality is, that, and the, the point of this holy book, and the point of, I think, all holy books, is that it brings a sense of order to a very chaotic universe. Our view of things is so limited that we have to come up with, and, and the, the universe is so complicated, that we have to come up with patterns and shorthands and, and try to figure out a way to interpret it and, and be able to get on with our day. And that's why we need words to do that, to give meaning to our lives. But even more than that, we need words to contain us, to define ourselves. And that's, I, I think, a lot of how we use words right now, is we, we, we're all just sort of begging to be defined in certain ways, and I think especially now with technology and globalization, it's so easy to get lost in the fog. Each of us is undefined in a way, and the world is becoming ever more undefined. And so I think a lot of the structures that we look to to try to contain ourselves look something like this, both in the sense of pound and hashtag. It's <laughs> trying to, to box ourselves in in certain ways and say, to, to look for, for certain entries in certain categories and say, yes, that's me. What we do is, is look at other people and say, you're like me, and so we are, we are an us. And that gives us meaning. That's just a way of borrowing meaning. The problem is, is that a lot of that depends on institutions. And there are so many of us now, and life is now so complicated and chaotic, that it's, we have to wall ourselves off. We're becoming fundamentalists in our faith. 
literalists. Because we all feel these, these categories start to fall apart. Have you noticed how many of our conversations now are about the definitions of words? I don't know how many times I've seen a, a conversation on the Huffington, the Huffington Post that starts, are you a feminist? What does feminist mean? Who on this debate stage is the real progressive? What does socialist mean? Who is a fascist? Who is a woman? Caitlyn Jenner. Who is black? Rachel Dolezal. These are the kind of conversations we have all the time, but they're not really about meaning. They're about how we package the world. And so I think the end result is that we end up looking something like this, where we allow words to define us. We forget that all words are made up. They're just models of how the world could be or should be. And so we're all withdrawing in our own communities of concern, speaking our own languages, when in fact the world is more than that. I think all of us feel that the categories that we use to give our lives meaning don't necessarily fit us all that well. And so we have to, we have to explain to people that, I, yes, I subscribe to this, but that doesn't define me. We have to keep doing this over and over, negotiating how we fit into the categories that we have. And I think, I think a lot of us feel boxed in by how we use these words. We forget that words are made up. It's not just my words, all words are made up. But not all of them mean something. And so I think what I'd like to, the image I have of where we are today, I think of Anne Frank, because she was in her little apartment in Amsterdam, and in a time when, when everyone around her was trying to organize humanity in a way that made sense with clean lines and brutal efficiency, she was on the inside organizing her own humanity. I think there's something really beautiful about that, because a lot of it was about her own confusion and her own vulnerability, and I think that's why we need a new kind of language that looks a little more like this. Because each of us could be anyone at any given time. We are not just one person. We are many people at once. And so we have to get more in line with, with how the world actually is, not to get too caught up in the models that we've imposed on the world. I think of uh, GPS devices tend to warn you, reminding you that the map you see is not the real world, so don't run into a lake. And I think we need the same reminder that the map is not the real world. And so if we run into to these problems, we have an option to define things for ourselves. We don't necessarily just have to borrow the meanings that give meaning to our lives. It is possible, and I know this because I've been doing it the last seven years, to come up with new metaphors that make the invisible visible. There's something really beautiful about that. And I think if, if we got in a better relationship with chaos, if we didn't stop, if we, if we stopped trying to oversimplify everything that was the, the interior storm that all of us are, are facing and the confusion and the vulnerability and how complicated the world really is, then we could feel a little more comfortable in our skin and we wouldn't have to withdraw within the categories that we allow to define us and we could take the power back from our words and define them. I think that's a little more healthy relationship. I don't know how many conversations would be benefited by someone, like the game catchphrase, where you're given the actual topic you're talking about so the challenge is, don't say that word. I think if, if we all did that, we'd be a little better off. Because it would allow a certain lexical fluidity that I think we're losing now. We're all just sort of trapped in our own lexicons that don't necessarily correlate with people who aren't already like us. And so I, I think I feel us drifting apart a little more every year, the more seriously we take words. Because remember, words are not real. They don't have meaning, we do. I think it's important to remember that. And if we took some sense of creativity and authorship 
in inventing who we are, that is possible. It is possible to try to, to reach for, for richer metaphors. This world has never been as complicated, and our lives have never been more complicated than they are right now. And so, you know, instead of just reaching for the nearest standardized word, or just begging to be diagnosed of something, it is, it is worth actually being present in sadness, for example, in the chaos of, of emotion. I think that's worth doing. I think we need new lenses to help contextualize the, the chaos that we face all the time. And if we do that, if each of us is willing to actually try to define who it is we are with some sense of creativity, I think the world could look a little more like this. Really messy. I think we are really messy people and the world is a really messy world. And I think this would not be so bad, us pouring out of these institutions which are weakening over time and meeting each other as we are in all our, our vulnerability, wearing our emotions on our sleeves. And I think as messy as it is, it would be a little more fulfilling to do that. And I, I'd like to leave you with a reading from one of my favorite philosophers, uh, Bill Watterson, who created Calvin and Hobbes. He said, creating a life that reflects your values and satisfies your soul is a rare achievement. To invent your own life's meaning is not easy, but it is still allowed, and I think you'll be happier for the trouble. Thank you.